Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today, I will be speaking with David Frum. David is a senior editor at The Atlantic magazine. He was a speechwriter for George Bush and has been well known in Republican political circles for many years. He's written many books, and he is one of Trump's most notable Republican critics. I wanted to get David on the podcast because he's obviously much more knowledgeable about government in general and and the Republican Party in particular than I am. And I wanted him to walk us through this moment in history and, and just talk about what we might expect to happen in the near term here and how maybe something good might come of all this. We don't say much that will be viewed as charitable toward Trump, but if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear that We really do our best to be even-handed. That doesn't paint a rosy picture, you'll see, but David's conservative bona fides are beyond dispute, and that makes his opinions about Trump and the people around him and the Republicans' support for him all the more incisive. So without further preamble, I bring you David Frum. I am here with David Frum. David, thank you for coming on the podcast. What a pleasure to be here. So listen, we've never met. It's, it's great to talk to you. I've been a fan of your work for quite some time, but my appreciation for you has just gone up by a factor of 10 in recent months, seeing your opposition to Trump and just imagining, imagining what your experience is like holding the line there. So I want to get into that. I want to talk about Trump, obviously, and the state of our country and the state of the media, but the challenge for us, given that we're going to to agree so much about the problem here, and given how much we each hate Trump, the challenge is really for us to say something that could conceivably persuade someone who doesn't already agree with us. I don't want us to just be indulging confirmation bias here or just rattling around our own echo chamber. I'd like us to be on our guard against exaggerating anything, and I really want us to say things about Trump and about the current situation that are as fully defended as possible. So with that in mind, let's just start with, can you summarize your political background and background as a writer so people who are less familiar with you can be up to speed? Sure. And those are great cautions. And thank you for the generous welcome. It's really wonderful of you to say that. I really appreciate it. Um, And maybe to answer your question about not getting bottlenecked, maybe after I give that introduction, maybe the place to start is like, I'm going to present some things where I think Donald Trump is saying some things that are, are, are worth hearing, some mm-hmm. things that are true, and where he's, where he's maybe, if he's not right, he's on to something important. But here's my background. I was born and grew up in Canada, in Toronto. Um, uh, my uh, mother was a, a quite well-known Canadian um, journalist, in fact, a very well-known Canadian journalist, a, a host of a radio show called As It Happens in the 1970s, and she went on to host a program called The Journal, which was um, the, the CBC's main, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's main late-night face-to-face television talk show in the 1980s. Uh, she died in 1992, age, age 54, um, an extraordinary career um, and much mm-hmm. missed, and a huge influence on me. Um, I uh, graduated from college in 1982, and I was very caught up in the politics of that time. The Class of 1982 was, these are people who had grown up during the chaos of the 1970s, caught up in the Reagan moment. And I think to this day, we are probably the most Republican-oriented cohort of people who are not absolutely old. And uh, so that was a huge influence on me. I worked for many conservative magazines over the years, National Review. I was on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, I worked for conservative think tanks, uh, the American Enterprise Institute and the Manhattan Institute. And to catch the story, I, I'll skip over mostly. Um, earlier parts, but to catch the story up into the more recent times, in 2001, I joined the uh, staff of the George W. Bush White House. I worked as a speechwriter there for two years. Uh, After that, um, I departed and wrote wrote some books. Um, I I wrote a history of the 1970s called How We Got Here. That was published just before I went into government. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote a memoir of my Bush time. I've written about eight books altogether, including most recently, recently a novel of all foolish things. Uh, I went to work from the Bush administration in the, at the American Enterprise Institute, where I did a lot of work on the need to understand the consequences of the failure of economic expansion to pay pay off for middle-income people. I wrote a book about that that was published in 2007, and I started a website on that subject called From Forum that flourished from about 2009 to 2012. 
I think I, I obviously overdid it because I got sacked by AEI in 2010 mm -hmm. for going a little too far. I, I was kind of disgruntled about that at the time. But in, in retrospect, I think if you drive through enough red lights, you can't be angry if the state trooper writes you a ticket. And uh, uh, have arrived at the Atlantic, where I'm senior editor. I've been working here since 2014. And I've written a number of articles on all of these various subjects and continue to um, write on the Atlantic website almost every day. You've done some amazing journalism there. With respect to this current moment, there's one article that has got to be among the most viral in recent history from The Atlantic. The title is How to Build an Autocracy. So many people have been talking about that. I actually want to ask you about the good case to be made for Trump if there is one, but let, let's hold off on that for a second. There's one sort of scene setting question that, that I'd like to ask you here, kind of a personal one, what your experience has been taking the stand that you have, because you're among the few really prominent conservatives who came out against Trump early and stayed against him. I put, you know, Bill Kristol and David Brooks and I guess Brett Stevens of the Wall Street Journal in that category as well. I've heard from other conservatives who've taken similar positions that their experience has just been a nightmare. I'm wondering, have you had a rough go of it at all or have you just come out of this unscathed? First, I can't complain. Compared to uh, what anybody has to put up with in a genuinely unfree country, um, it's nothing. Second, I would say, you remember that saying, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog? Right. I have two do I have two dogs, so, so I have good friends. But more seriously, actually, I, I think I've gotten off quite lightly compared to some other people, and that was maybe due to the experience I mentioned in the setup bit, where I, I've been through this before. This happened, I went through this experience in a much more traumatic way between uh, 2009 and 2010. And at that point, I was concerned that the, the then new Tea Party movement was way too radical, way too hot. Um, and uh, I urged a more restrained form of opposition to President Obama. The article that got me fired from AEI actually was one uh, I'd been writing through 2009 and 2010 to those conservatives who imagined that by stopping um, the health care law, they would destroy the Obama administration. Please remember, the Democrats have also seen this movie. They know how it ends if they don't hold together. They will hold together. They will pass this law. And so the smart thing to do is to negotiate. It's full of things that you don't like, but it's also got things in it that, that you should like. So this is a time to do business, uh, right. to negotiate, because uh, this law will pass. And if it passes over your opposition, you will be spending the next quarter century trying to fix things that you could fix for the asking today. On the day the law passed at the end of March, or it, it, it didn't, that it overcame the last procedural hurdle after which it was a clear shot toward the president's signature, and that was the end of March 2010, um, I wrote uh, a blog post on my site called Waterloo that said, people like Kim DeMint had promised that by breaking this law, it, they would deliver a Waterloo of defeat to President Obama. This is the uh, Waterloo, indeed, of the radical Republican opposition. This law will never be repealed. I still hold to that prediction. Um, yes, Republicans will do well in 2010, but legislative ma majorities come and go. This law is forever. And the radicals led us to disaster. And after that, I went through the experience that many of my uh, anti-Trump conservative friends are having now of true social isolation, true accusations of betrayal, uh, mm -hmm. saying, you know, the only reason you say this thing is because of those legendary George, Georgetown cocktail parties that anybody, um, that, that radical critics always presume that people would pay any price to attend. Um, they're not so great. Um, and I, I went through that experience. In fact, for me now, what um, on a personal level, I find I've been operating this little lemonade stand by the side of the road, and I'm now seeing a lot of people stopping by to buy lemonade. So it's actually been a kind of congenial experience. Uh, and I've had this kind of grim amusement, not surprise, of seeing that a lot of the people told me in 2010 that by saying we should try to come up with a market-centered approach to universal health care coverage, that I was a sellout with that principles, they are now working for Donald Trump or apologizing for him, and a case where, you, where there is no principal case for doing this. And uh, that has been a, you know, a kind of grim, grim amusement to watch that. Yeah. Well, what was your experience watching the actual election results come in? I was totally surprised. I, totally surprised. I was on, um, I was in Canada. I was on the set of the CBC News. They had a panel um, co uh, covering the election results. And I have, I was stunned. I, they were in, not what I'd expected. I'm quite sure, for example, that Trump could not break through in Michigan because of the high levels of minority vote in that state, but he did. So I was blindsided. I was up till three o'clock in the morning that night. Um, 
you know, it was, it was an overpowering thing. I was actually um, coming out of a TV studio at three in the morning with the streets deserted um, in Toronto, foreign city, um, and walked back to the hotel I was staying at. It was really cold, but I walked anyway. And you just felt like there had been this, a, a chapter in one's life and human history had just mm -hmm. turned in a way that I, I knew then was, was not going to be good. Uh, nothing good was, was waiting for us. We're going to get into the, the dark side in a moment, but to start and to be as generous as possible without being delusional, what is the smartest case you have heard in defense of Trump? If you had to give the most respectable case for having supported him until this point and for continuing to support him even now, what is that case? Well, Donald Trump got, got and even continues to get three big things right that the rest of the political process had tended to ignore. Um, the first of those things is the crisis in what is happening in American rural life. You know, uh, Donald Trump uh, uses the phrase uh, inner city a lot when he wants to convey um, trouble and drugs and crime and despair. But actually, you know, centers, American center cities are having an amazing revival almost everywhere, even in some pretty hard crest places like the Clevelands and the Philadelphias. The center cities are doing fine. Uh, where you see uh, real trouble is in the small towns and, um, and rural areas, uh, drug abuse and mm. family breakdown um, and, and levels of imprisonment, signs of social dysfunction that you would associate with the beginnings of the crisis in black America in the 1970s. Um, and Donald Trump went to those places and channeled uh, the unhappiness of those people who, um, you know, a lot of the rest of the political process have tended, you know, they should just move. They should just, you know, move to Brooklyn and serve coffee. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he understood them and intuited what they were about. And that is really important. They have not been heard and they needed to be heard. The drug crisis in America is a rural phenomenon as much or more as an urban phenomenon. He got right that we have had a series of beliefs about trade that grew up in the days when we we're building a trade system to, that included fellow democracies um, and then uh, the Pacific Rim countries that maybe they weren't always democratic, but at least they were small, um, places like Taiwan and Singapore. Um, they, they weren't, at the time we brought them into the world trade system, not democratic, but they were not also so big as to make a difference to anybody else. And then we applied all of those ideas to China's arrival into the world economy. Mm -hmm. And it has not worked in the same way. Um, the that we have had chronic and massive trade imbalances with China, and those have caused real, harsh, ongoing dislocation for a lot of Americans who do, who work in traded sectors. And while we talk a lot about, well, the winners will compensate the losers and we can retrain people, we don't do anything about that in proportion to the severity of the shock. And Donald Trump was talking about something important when he, when he talked about the trade arrangements that worked in the past have stopped working for a lot of Americans since the year 2000. And the third thing I think where he's making, he has made, he perceived something true and made a real contribution was on the immigration issue. Immigration is described by economists as the only policy that creates no, that has no costs, only benefits. Well, that's not true. It has large costs. They're, they're invisible to those of us who talk about it because we don't pay them. Um, but they, uh, the costs of immigration, both economic and cultural, um, are heavy. Uh, they fall on the bottom 30% or 40% of American society. And even discussing those costs has been so beyond the pale in Mains in the media mainstream and the political mainstream uh, that this issue just went was waiting there for somebody to talk to it, and Donald Trump did. Right. There's another case that people tend to make. I grant all of that. I think I think all of that is interesting, but none of that suggests that Trump himself would be the right person to implement any changes in any of those three areas. One argument I keep encountering from reasonably smart people or ostensibly smart people, in defense of Trump, the man, really, and, and all of his erratic unprofessionalism, as was totally on display in his last press conference, people seem to think that there's something about him being a little nuts or seeming a little nuts, which in just a purely game-theoretic way could turn out well for us both domestically and as a matter of foreign policy. Domestically, we have just this ossified political system 
with vested interests and bureaucracy and deep state. And he is like a wrecking ball that is just swinging through that and clearing out the mess that it would take someone like Trump, perhaps someone as unhinged as Trump, someone as narcissistic as Trump, to do that dirty work. And as a matter of foreign policy, it could be advantageous, again, just, just along game theoretic lines, to have a bull in a china shop, right, who, who will break the right stuff and who will keep our adversaries on their toes because now they're dealing with a, with a genuinely erratic, not always rational person. And so we could expect our adversaries, like North Korea or Iran or even China and Russia, to be somehow more compliant. Does any of that make sense to you? No. I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry to say. I know it's not your own view. Uh, yeah. First, when you connect, when you speak about Trump the man, um, I, as I said, I'm quite sympathetic. Uh, I think I have something to learn from his voters on trade, and I'm quite sympathetic to his message on immigration. And, and I've been worrying about the problems of rural life and what's happening to the American working class. Now. That's been a major theme of my writing since 2000. But this is a little bit like the, the story of the, the legendary Plotkin diamond. Uh, the Plotkin diamond is one of the most beautiful diamonds on earth, uh, very romantic, it's got a long and storied history. The Plotkin diamond unfortunately comes attended, as famous diamonds often do, by a terrible curse. And the terrible curse is Mr. Plotkin. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that is true here. I, for Donald Trump the man, there is no defense. Um, and all the things, those, those, that case you make, I mean, instead of ingenious, and you can well see that somebody would have made it during the campaign, but Donald Trump on the day we speak has been president for um, close to a month. And we have seen that it's just not true, actually, that he's not, on a domestically, he's not cutting through the bureaucracy. On the contrary, because he is so massively disorganized and incompetent, that on something like staffing his government, he is lagging far behind. Uh, he has not nominated the 700 or so pre, um, Senate confirmed positions. He's nominated uh, he's, uh, only about 90 of those. The, that has, if you're a Republican-leaning person who wants to get, get, say, a tax cut through Congress, that has really ominous potential because if people, if the Senate is not confirming people in January and February, that means it will be confirming them in April and May, by which time you should be passing major bills. The Senate's time is a very finite resource. And if the schedule gets clogged later because the president was too disorganized um, to get his uh, appointments done early, then you're going to discover major parts of your, leg of your legislative agenda fall apart. Abroad, it's even worse. The President of the United States has the power to end organized human life on this planet. He has, there are almost zero checks on his power to do that. It is really important that the United States, as a nuclear superpower, as the dominant power on Earth, behave in a way that is predictable. Uh, in fact, an unpredictable United States empowers adversaries. It does not deter them. And what is especially ominous here, you listed potential adversaries, North Korea, Iran, China, and Russia, well, one of those adversaries, Russia, has just graduated from the rank of adversary to something else that is really sinister. And that goes back again to the unpredictability of this government is, I don't know what Russia is now. Is it quasi-ally? Is it a patron? But it's got a power inside the US government that is unjustified and undisclosed and deeply ominous. And that too comes from Trump's erratic nature. So no, I think there is no, for him, I think the verdict is, there's, there, there's a dispute whether Warren Harding ever actually said these words, but words attributed to him on his deathbed, looking back on his presidency, I'm unfit for this place and never should have come here. Mm -hmm. That is going to be Donald Trump's epitaph, although he would lack the self-knowledge ever to pronounce that himself. Yeah, well, needless to say, I am deeply sympathetic with, with that summary of him. I've never seen, even for a moment, a real method to the guy's madness. I mean, people have been interpreting his boastfulness and his his speaking style as a kind of stagecraft, as a kind of master level communication to the masses and a brilliant plane of the media. I have just been seeing the ejaculations of a disordered personality. I've seen someone who's so malignantly selfish and so uninformed, though occasionally he can string a few sentences together. At bottom, he is deeply inarticulate. I mean, he has a kind of confabulatory mind where he will get tripped up by his own word choices and take garden paths through his own mind that he was clearly <laughs> not intending, right? He was not yeah. intending to speak of something, but the word just came out and then he's off and running on that topic. Yeah. And this 
goes to questions of policy, it goes to questions of what our country will do next. It's terrifying to behold, but you have people who are enamored of an interpretation of this, which is not only exculpatory, but just praises the man to the skies as a kind of next level genius communicator. Well, the thought that you're in the car with a hopelessly drunk driver at the wheel um, is so upsetting that you want to believe that the driver must have some secret plan. But I do, I do think there, there is some method to the madness. Um, I don't think Donald Trump is a strategic visionary. He never has a plan. But what, what he is very good at in his business career, as far as he, he makes impulsive decisions that are usually bad decisions. All of his shrewdness and canniness is applied after the fact. What he's very good at is having made a bad decision, shifting the cost of that decision onto other people, hmm. finding people to blame, um, finding people to cheat. Uh, he's very good at that. And, and he is a master communicator of a particular kind. He is so deeply aggrieved. He is so, de he is so irresponsible that he's, he's able to speak in ways that strike a chord with other people who feel those same levels of grievances. Hmm. Uh, I am not in any way making a Hitler analogy here. I want to, I, I'm going to say, I may have occasion to say that more than once. As the analogy I often use is that people, one of the reasons to study history is so that you're not always making Hitler analogies right. and you understand right. that there are a lot of ways that things can be bad. You can be on a bad train, but it has many stops before you arrive at Hitler station. Yeah. Um, but one of the contemporary observers of Hitler's rise to power, an American journalist named Dorothy Thompson, wrote an essay in the early 1930s about who was susceptible in Germany to Hitler and who was not. And one of the things she noted was that happy people never became Nazis. And I think there is something, but there's something that Donald Trump, he's so full of bitterness and rage. And you look at the people in his inner circle. There's not a person in his inner, inner circle, except for his uh, daughter and son-in-law, and they have to be there. But there's not a person who's come into his inner circle who has a fully functioning personal life. Mm -hmm. um, they are all people who are full of rage. General Flynn enraged at Obama for firing him from the Defense Intelligence Agency for incompetence. Steve Bannon, a man who obviously has tremendous rage and addiction issues, three marriages, three divorces. Um, the others as well. Um, there, and there are millions of people in America who, speak, who say, you know what, I am just delighted to see Donald Trump be rude to the snobs. I don't care what he's going to do to me. It'll be worth it. Right. Well, let's take a moment to talk about the Republicans for a second, because obviously they are shouldering a lot of the responsibility for what happens now. I'm by no means the first person to make this point, but I think it's, it's very interesting and, and uncanny to consider what the world would be like if this situation were reversed. I mean, imagine if Clinton had won the presidency without winning the popular vote and with evidence of assistance from Russia, right? The RNC had been hacked and Clinton had delighted in this during the campaign, it had even called for more hacking. And then inexplicably, she had only positive things to say about Vladimir Putin, a thug who jails and even kills his political opponents. And let's say she's vastly wealthy, even more than she is, and yet known to have financial ties to Russia, right? And She's refused to release her tax returns, even though she promised to release them once her audit was over. But now she, now as president, she's refusing. And she's appointed multiple people to her administration who have unusually deep connections to Russia, right? And then we learn that some of these people were in dialogue with Russian intelligence during the campaign and that Russia was attempting to influence the election with a continuous stream of hacked leaks and state propaganda. So you have this just reverse picture with Clinton. Imagine how the Republicans, the party of Reagan, the party that, that won the Cold War, would have responded to this. Is it safe to say that we would be in a, in a completely different situation with the Republicans just going berserk? Well, that's, that's, clear, that's clearly right. I mean, it's... I... Have occasion to had to point out, Alger Hiss just had a lousy job at the Department of Agriculture, and that seemed like a big deal. Um, an even more poignant comparison though, is obviously, you know, the Republicans would have the opposite position if they were in the opposite situation. How would the Democratic Party react? And if this, if we had a Hillary Clinton in the situation, and mm -hmm. what is striking is, I think they would be much less in lockstep with the President Clinton. 
than Republicans are in lockstep with President Trump. And one of the ways to understand the Republican Party is to imagine, okay, well, if this were the Democratic Party, if this were, if this were Clinton presidency and the Democrats, why would the Democrats be less in lockstep than the Republicans are? And I'll, I'll point to a couple of reasons for that, and this is illuminating. The first and most important is Democrats get their information from a lot of different competing information sources. Um, you know, yeah, there are a lot of rank and file Democrats who um, read Facebook and get sort of angry messages from Michael Moore. But, but the leadership of the Democratic Party really is influenced by the New York Times and the Washington Post um, and is much more influenced by um, those things than it is by even its favorite talkers, people like Rachel Maddow. Maddow is obviously very important, but she is not. She doesn't. She is not the sun and moon of democratic communications. Yeah. Un, there are ways by which unwelcome information can penetrate the consciousness, not just of leaders, but of the rank and file, and be important. People can say, "Wait a minute, our party leader is doing things that are risky and dangerous and, and unacceptable," uh, even if Maddow denies it. The New York Times is reporting on it. So that's one difference. The second is uh, that. Uh, the, the Democratic Party, because it is a coalition of many different kinds of groups, it is, it's just always more fractious, right? The, the, Demo, the Democratic Party is the party of the country's most recent immigrants, of African Americans, but also college professors and also of, you know, um, the Silicon Valley and New York hedge fundies. Um, mm -hmm. there, there, there are so many internal important cultural differences. Um, and, and the last is that the Democratic Party has built party structures that are less hierarchical. There, there are places to stand. So Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders can battle it out to the end. And each of them continues to draw important resources from important, important different parts of the Democratic Party. There's no way that one of them can turn off the resource flow to the other. And none of those things are true in the Republican Party. Uh, one other difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and this is really relevant to why Donald Trump is able to get away with it. One, I, I've written a, 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 a bunch of articles that sort of stand as a series. One of them that I think has retained, I, in my opinion, a lot of relevance is something I wrote at the beginning of 2016 when I talked about Trump's then looming victory. That one of the big reveals of this cycle was how much the Republican rank and file hated its traditionally constituted leadership. Uh, and that the situation was just ripe for a disruptive agent to break the connection between the party rank and file and even the party donors and the congressional and state leadership. And that is what Donald Trump has done. He has now got a direct connection with the base in a way that makes, that frightens a person like Paul Ryan mm. and also makes Paul Ryan realize the only way Paul Ryan can achieve his agenda is by subordinating himself to Donald Trump, not by challenging him. I think Ryan is an interesting lens through which to look at this. So. Do you think that is what explains the reticence of, of Ryan at this point, just the fact that he realizes that Trump has a hold of the base and his political future is more or less entirely dependent on not pissing off Trump's base? Paul Ryan had some negative words to say after the Access Hollywood tape came out, um, in which he even suggested that he would not endorse Donald Trump. His standing in the National Party dropped by 20 points within a week. Donald Trump, one of, one of the things that he has done that, it, that is kind of amazing is he has broken to his will every institution in the Republican Party, including Fox News, which began much more skeptical of him. They fought him and he beat them. He beat Fox News. He beat the Bush machine. He beat Paul Ryan. This is not a situation where Republicans agree with him. It is because many of these people do not and continue not to, although Fox News is now in line. Uh, but they have been bested by him and they are subordinated to him and they are bound to him. They've struck a devil's bargain. As always with devil's bargain, the devil is not honoring his share. Paul Ryan is going to be stunned, I think by this point he sort of figured it out, at how little of his agenda he gets from Trump and how much he ends up defending a very different Trump agenda. But they are riding, there is no obvious way to get off this ride. Well, there's one way to get off this ride. They could impeach him. And we're going to get into the, the implications of Russia's involvement, whatever it is, in our democratic process. But just speaking generically, how bad would a scandal have to be before you would be confident that the Republicans would impeach Trump? Like one example that just comes to mind, if his tax returns were leaked by the IRS, I'm not sure if such a thing is possible, but let's say that happened, and they showed that he had massive indebtedness to the Russian oligarchs, what would happen? If that happened today, I don't yeah. think you'd be. I don't think you'd be impeached for that. 
Hey, having debts isn't a high crime and misdemeanor. Everybody has debts. I'm trying to get my jaw off the floor. Sam, you know he's got a $600 million mortgage with the Bank of China. That's report. We know that. That's, mm -hmm. that's been reported. That was on the front page of the New York Times before the election. That wasn't enough to alarm people on two or three of his office buildings. Um, his, his son, Don Jr., told an investor conference in 2008 that a hugely disproportionate share of their income comes from Russian sources. Right. That's on the record, and that was almost a decade ago. Um, anybody who walks into a Trump-branded property in Florida and looks at the names on the mailboxes uh, can, can understand where Trump's money comes from. And, and, uh, and anyone familiar with Trump's finances understand he, pr he probably owes a lot of money to somebody, and no American bank will lend him anything. So who's he getting his money from? Uh, these are not mysteries. Okay, so let's back, because I, I want to ask you more about his, what you think about his finances, but take me back to the possibility of impeachment. What could do it? I mean, do you have to find a, a, a severed head in, in his gym bag? I mean, what, what could Trump do? I could imagine he could have a press conference so erratic where everyone would have to admit that we are now being ruled by a madman. We just had one of those. He takes down his pants at the next press conference, right? And calls everyone cucks. That's refreshing. That, that kind of straight speech is refreshing. The American <laughs> people, Sam, they voted for authenticity and Donald Trump gave them authenticity. You know, it's just you inside the Beltway people who live on the Pacific Ocean, you inside the Beltway people don't understand this. the charm of a pantsless president. Exactly. I mean, in Toledo, Ohio, people take their pants. People are lucky to have pants. You know, all, you know, all of you with pants, you elitists. Um, Look, th these are political decisions. Um, so long as that core base adheres to Trump, so long as Fox News finds it is a better marketing decision to be pumping out pro-Trump messaging than to question him, the, the party will, however unhappily, hold together. And so long as it has a majority in Congress, um, in both houses of Congress, he will not be removed. W here's one of the things, and I, I think in a way this is too early, I don't want makes it your podcast, but I think people are looking for a, some kind of external solution where the Trump presidency goes away on its own. Something happens to save us from the situation. And one of my big messages to people, it's the message at the end of my Atlantic article, is no one is going to help you. You have to do it. Um, there is not going to be an impeachment. There's not going to be a 25th Amendment process. The Republicans of Congress are not going to spontaneously come to their senses. The, all the things you want them to know, they know. They've had private meetings with him. They know how crazy he is. And if they don't know how crooked he is, they have a pretty good idea. The line I keep using about Donald Trump is while there are many secrets about the Trump presidency, there are no mysteries. Everything you need to know, you know. Many things you'd like to know, you don't know. But the things you need to know, you know all of them. You know he's a crook. You know he is beholden uh, to the Russians in ways he shouldn't be. You know he's surrounded himself with people who have no business being in government at all. And you, you know Paul Manafort um, has worked for the past 15 years with the Russian secret police to pillage the people of Ukraine, and he made tens of millions of dollars for himself in the process. You, all those things you know. Um, you may not know exactly to whom he has, to Donald Trump has debts and how much. Um, you may not know whether he's bound to Vladimir Putin by blackmail or by um, hope of bigger financial gains or by a genuine spirit of admiration or by ideological, there are things you don't know, but the, the story is all known. So if you want to do something about this, it's up to you. And when I say you, I mean the people who are listening, and it's up to me. I and mean, we have to, we have to act. I, I think Donald Trump is, in many ways, God's judgment on us. Sorry, that's a forbidden word mm. on this program. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Not at all. I can take it in the spirit and take it. <laughs> um, but is a judgment on us for not being better citizens, and if we not being better consumers of information, not being more committed to the political process, not working harder to persuade friends and neighbors. That sometimes, I mean, I say this of myself too, that, you know, uh, to overcome your normal, to recognize the unique event where you have to overcome a lot of your normal political impulses. And if we're going to defend the country and the Constitution, we have to be better citizens. And no one else is going to do that for us. When you say it's on us, it's on us to do what? Pressure Congress to act? I mean, is that what, what lever is within reach of people's changing opinions? I advocate infinite effort on behalf of very finite goals. I think people who are um, alarmed by Donald Trump need to focus on one or at most two things they want from him. And my recommendations are a law requiring 
the Secretary of the Treasury to release the tax returns of any major party candidate for president and, the, of course, the sitting president and vice president every year. And second, we need an independent inquiry um, with subpoena, full massive subpoena powers uh, to get to the bottom of the Trump-Russia connection. Let's do those two things. And, let, and everyone should be talking to their member of Congress, their senator, all the time about those two things. And I, I'm not telling you that if you're like a, you know, a anti-gun person or a pro-choice um, person, you, you forget the rest of your politics. But I think the Women's March on Washington that happened just after the inaugural, although inspiring in many ways, was an example of how things are not done right. Those people had a lot of other, too many demands and, and too many people they would not stand on the same platform with. If you're serious about containing Trump, you have to be there with Second Amendment people for the release of the tax returns. You have to be there with pro-life people for the release of the tax returns. Uh, the model here is mothers against drunk driving. If you're against drunk driving, they worked with you. Didn't matter what else you thought. Didn't, you didn't even have to be a mother. Yeah. But you think that nothing in the tax returns could be so disqualifying as to affect his impeachment? I think nothing in the tax returns will, if they were somehow leaked tomorrow, would in themselves drive the Republicans to um, support, to vote for impeachment. But here's what would happen. Here's what I do think. First, if there were the votes in Congress to pass the law I'm talking about, I think you'd discover that Donald Health Trump would take a sudden turn for the worse. Mm -hmm. he, he would discover that his health did not allow him to continue to serve in this office. Are tax returns really sufficient? Wouldn't we need like a, a full forensic audit of his and his family's finances? You might, but here's why I think the tax returns would tell you a lot. And I, uh, one of the things when you asked me my biography, one, one of the things, there's another aspect of my life that is maybe relevant here, which is um, uh, I, I have been for a time, I, I've worked in the real estate industry, and um, that's what I spent a lot of time doing between 2010 and 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I understand a little bit, real estate finance does tend to show up in your personal tax returns. Um, your partnership, because what you want to do is you want to have um, a lot of these uh, losses flow from the corporate side into your personal side. Remember, Donald Trump has that big $900 million or so tax loss that he mm. took in, and he's continuing to offset personal income taxes against that tax loss. And that means he is, uh, that must mean, or it, must, it suggests it means that he's organized his affairs so that he is declaring uh, partnership income and royalty income uh, in the same places that he's declaring that he's taking these losses. And since the losses are on the personal return, therefore that's what the, where those other income sources must be. And then and and you have to do disclosures. By the way, another thing you're required to do on your income tax return is disclose any foreign bank account you have that over ten thousand um, dollars. If he, so, anywhere where he would have money, that would be in an annex. Um, now he may not have disclosed it, but then that that would also be trouble. So I think we would learn a lot. You wouldn't necessarily learn the identity of all his, of his partners, and you wouldn't learn, uh, oh, and one of the things you have to do is not only declare how much money over a foreign bank account, but the maximum amount of money you had at any point in that year. When you talk about leaking the returns, I, I don't think um, the IRS would ever do that, that and, and nor should they, of course. Right. But the one little glimmer, the reason we know about the $900 million loss is that somebody leaked his, I forget now what year it was, I think 1994, New York State income tax return, and which was interesting to me about that is it, it turns out um, leaking a federal income tax return, however it comes into your possession, even if you find it in the street, is a major crime for whoever released it. But it turns out that in New York, lease, releasing a state tax return is not such a major crime. So whoever had access to that account, whether it was an attorney or an accountant or somebody else or an attorney and accountant for Donald Trump's ex-wife, Marla Maples, who co-signed that return. Um, they had the wit to know that releasing the New York State passage would tell you many of the things you needed to know about the federal taxes, but with much less legal liability. And there may be somebody out there waiting the moment to do that thing again. Mm. I'm sort of amazed. I mean, maybe I'm naive here, but I'm, I've been amazed that no business journalist has won his Pulitzer Prize by getting to the bottom of Trump's finances during the campaign. And it always seemed like he was he was very likely exaggerating his wealth by maybe even a factor of ten. Tim O'Brien, who was editor-in-chief of Bloomberg News, uh, wrote a big book about Trump's finances about a dozen years ago and was, was sued. Uh, Trump lost. And in the course of the lawsuit, uh, O'Brien uh, did discovery and learned a lot about Trump's tax returns. Uh, as part of the settlement process, he signed a non, um, he signed, they sealed the record and he signed a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and so there are things he can't say. But, but uh, 
Tim O'Brien has always been sort of like rolling his eyes and moving his shoulder blades as if to indicate, oh, you know, if you knew what I knew, uh, you know, Donald Trump has always been like one step ahead of the bailiffs. Um, although that's about to change. He's now, whatever he was on the day before election day, um, I think he's already a substantially richer man than he was then. And he and his immediate family, and there are no disclosures on, of course, on immediate presidential relatives by um, not taking a salary in the executive branch. Jared Kushner has defeated a lot of other federal disclosure rules. Um, they're about to become very, very seriously rich, uh, post-Soviet style rich. That's the irony. That he's about to become as rich as he's always lied about being. Perhaps just take a moment to paint a picture of what that's like. How can Trump and the family enrich themselves as a result of being in power? Oh, so, so many ways, and many of them not, many of them improper, but not illegal. For example, um, somebody uh, is building right now a shopping mall in Malaysia, um, and uh, they decide they want the Trump Organization to um, have a role. And uh, they're so happy to have the Trump Organization there that they ask for no money down. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll give you a 25% share of the profits. Uh, you pay out your nominal share of the investment from the profits when they arrive. Everything after that is yours to keep. We would never even know such a thing happened. Hmm. And uh, that would probably, uh, and if, unless you can demonstrate that um, there's a strict quid pro quo bribe, it's not clear uh, that any of that would be illegal. The United States now has one of the loosest bribery laws in the developed world, especially loose after, uh, you may remember the, um, the trial of uh, Virginia Governor Bob McDonald. No, but I won't hold that against you. Okay, well, this, this is, it, it's, it, the story starts boring, but it gets good, I promise. Um, so Mac McDonald was the governor of Virginia. He had a patron who gave him and his wife a, a couple hundred thousand dollars of various kinds of benefits, cash, fancy clothes, fancy watches. Mm -hmm. And McDonald, uh, and then in, he, um, the patron ran a vitamin supplement company and McDonald arranged a series of meetings for him with important people in the state government uh, to, in, in which he would tout the state government should be including his supplements within the state's Medicaid and other insurance programs. Um, McDonald and his wife were convicted on a, something like 20 counts of corruption and sentenced, they were both sentenced to prison. He appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court overturned the sentence. Um, because, and the, the, new, the law they made, the law had always been you were guilty of bribery only if there was a quid, that is, you received something, there was a quo, you did something, and we could prove the pro in the middle. That is, that, that the favor, you could prove that the favor was done because of the gift. You couldn't merely point to the favor and point to the gift and convict the politician. You had to prove intentionality. So that's already incredibly hard. But the Supreme Court then add, said something else. And the quid quo quo had to buy, persuade the politician to do what the court called an official act. And setting up, merely setting up a meeting with a state bureaucrat is not an official act because that's just something the politician did as a politician and not as an office holder. So it is legal to take money and set up meetings for, for the guy who gave up the money if you, as the politician, are not the person who then says, okay, and here's the corrupt contract. That's on the bureaucrat. So uh, in that Malaysia case I mentioned, it's going to be very hard uh, to come up with a criminal uh, conviction. Um, providing the Trump organization declares all the taxes and meets all of those technical requirements, um, a lot of this stuff may be legal. They're doing these things right now. The, the, uh, this weekend, the, uh, air, um, the two Trump boys will be in Dubai with millions of dollars in security costs to the trans, uh, uh, sorry, UAE, Abu Dhabi, mm. with millions of dollars in security costs to the taxpayer as a result, and they will be promoting the, a hotel property that they are opening there. Do you think the state government of Abu Dhabi is going to be looking with more favor on that project than it looked a year ago? Obviously, that's that stinks, but it's, it's happening and it's not illegal. So this is not something that falls under the emoluments clause. But the emoluments clause is not self-executing. Uh, it is for, it is forbidden for people uh, for the president to take these foreign gratuities. But defining what is an emolument requires a statute, and there isn't a statute. Mm. Um, and it's not clear who would have authority to bring a case, and it's it's not clear. By the way, the Emoluments Clause refers to princes or governments. It's not clear that the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi uh, is covered by the Emoluments Clause. It's certainly not clear that the brother-in-law of the Interior Minister of Abu Dhabi, who's a private businessman, ho, 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 mm -hmm. um, that he's covered by it. And it, by the way, and it certainly doesn't apply to the president's relatives. Right. Okay, so I, wa I want to talk, talk about Russia and Putin and the leaks. But before we do, again, I want to just be as charitable as, as we can muster here. 
Is there anything to be said against the intelligence communities leaking this information about Flynn? And, and are we, who are now calling for an investigation, setting a dangerous precedent by encouraging such leaks and empowering these deep state actors to essentially hamstring any future executive in our government? Uh, Eli Lake wrote a column about this, which I, I guess you're referring to a very powerful column, um, saying that what is what um, the FBI or the CIA or whoever's looking into this matter is doing by leaking against General Flynn is pretty sinister because, look, people can be investigated for all kinds of things, at which at the end of the process, you realize they've done nothing wrong. Um, and their reputation should mean, should not be destroyed in the process of an investigation. Um, we expect law enforcement to keep quiet until they file charges. And if they, if they investigate and find no basis to drop charges, even if they inwardly think that you maybe did it, they, you know, that's not enough. A policeman thinking you maybe did it is not enough grounds to destroy your reputation. And in the case of Flynn, he's now going to be plunged into a very substantial legal cost. So I, I get all of that. That said, let's under, these are not passive victims here. Um, and for, uh, first, we are in a situation where the president himself has begun, by, he has begun by making clear that he intends to upend the national security system of the United States because uh, he keeps talking about how the CIA is defective and it's got all these problems, but he's full of people who know inconveniently much about his activities. And he's going to try to reorganize these services to quash them. And the president has a lot of power to silence these investigations. Um, if, if it happens, if, you, if you're sitting at the next desk and you know the guy at the, the desk beside you has been working on the Trump-Russia stuff, and suddenly that guy is reassigned to Mongolia and his wife is reassigned to Vancouver, and they have to quit the service because of the terrible job they've just been given, you get the message. And they do that three times, four times, five times. Um, if people don't get bonuses, if people, and, e and that's even before uh, the Republicans pass a law, which is probably a pretty good idea under a normal president to make it easier to fire uh, civil servants, hmm. be even before the firings actually start. Next, um, we are dealing with a government where the normal process of investigation is broken. Congress has made it clear they're not going to investigate the Russia connection in any meaningful way. Uh, there's not going to be an independent investigation. And these agents feel the breath of Trump on their neck. How much longer are they going to be allowed to continue investigating? At what point are their records destroyed? Um, that many people in these services feel that, it, feel that it's going to happen. And finally, I do think there's something, this is maybe an ad hominem point, but you know, Donald Trump and Mike Flynn are not well situated to make the point that illegally obtained information mm. Yeah. <laughs> should not be used. That was the basis of their final argument to the American people. Again, that's an ad hominem. Even people who violate the rights of others are entitled to have their own rights respected. Yeah. Got it. Still, it, it is, it is, uh, it's hard to feel sympathetic. There's a certain degree of hypocrisy that is hard to ignore in the interests of maintaining our institution's integrity. I mean, this story about Russia's hacking of the election and here I mean not hacking voting machines, who knows what they attempted there, but just the DNC hack and the effectiveness of their propaganda, and Trump's unspecified connections to Russia. This story was on the verge of going away, it seemed. People were seeming to forget that this had happened, and this is one of the most alarming things I can recall happening. There's nothing like this in our politics. So this leak brought that story back. So I guess my basic question to you is, what's the most sinister interpretation of Trump's entanglement with Russia that you still find plausible? And what's the most innocuous one? Well, revert to my observation about many secrets, no mysteries. Uh, I don't know whether we will find collusion or coordination between people around Donald Trump or Donald Trump himself, conceivably, and Russian intelligence. Mm. I don't know yet, and let's let's say we never do. We never find that proof. And let's let's, 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 let's let's it just was a giant goddamn coincidence. It's still terribly unacceptable. So here we have um, a candidate for president who, in full view of all of us, worked with a Russian intelligence operation. That's what WikiLeaks is. Now that statement, how controversial a claim is that about WikiLeaks? Um, I think it was a lot more controversial six months ago than it is today. All right, so here, here, here's the case against WikiLeaks. All intelligence experts agree that the De Democratic National Committee, the DCCC, which is uh, the fundraising arm of the House Democrats, and John Podesta, these were the, the places where the information came. Those hacks were done by Russian intelligence. 
That material then shows up on the WikiLeaks site. How did they get it? Well, pro WikiLeaks people tell a story that the way WikiLeaks got that information was uh, that there was an, a, an internal staffer at the, at the Democratic National Committee. Sometimes they say it was this poor young man who was shot dead by a robber um, in a DC park. Mm. Um, and that there was a handoff of this information from uh, this internal agent to uh, a former British ambassador to Uzbekistan in Archibald Glover Park in Washington, which is, as I sit here talking to you, um, is a couple blocks away from me. I often walk my dogs in Archibald Glover Park. And when I hear this story, I think, how did he not get run down by a bicycle? as this happened, or bitten by one of the thousands of dog walkers. I mean, really, why would you not just put a giant sign over your head? I don't know how you could be more conspicuous than doing this fake spy movie exchange. Why do people never use thumb drives, by the way, in these things? Why do they never meet in Starbucks? Now, the story told, uh, the story told to create a possibility of an innocent, of a non-Russian intelligence. It, it, they're so crazy, these stories. That, mm. Anyway, we, we, know, we know who did the burglary. And we know that the, what, the necklace is in your shop window. And maybe there is a chain of conveyance between the burglars and you, but you are not in innocent possession of that necklace. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't buy the Archibald Glover Park handoff story. It's just ridiculous. Um, okay, so, uh, and we also know that WikiLeaks, there's a long pattern uh, where WikiLeaks presents information that is convenient and useful to the Russian state. Mm. And what we also know is that they have when whenever there is any pressure on Donald Trump, they go berserk. Um, they are actually fairly above board about this in their in their pro-Trumpist sympathies and their intense detestation of of not just Hillary Clinton but mainstream politicians throughout the West. Like the, the, the campaign of disinformation they're running against Emmanuel Macron, who's the non-Putinist candidate for president of France in the elections of spring, where they're suggesting he's uh, he's living a secret life and that he's pretending to be married and Catholic and have kids, but in fact, he's been secretly a pedophile all along. Anyway, so that, so that all happened. So Trump praising WikiLeaks and, um, and ur urging the Russians to hack Hillary Clinton's emails more and not speaking up on behalf of Americans whose rights were being violated by a foreign intelligence espionage operation. We all, that all happened on television. We all saw that. That's yeah. not a secret. Um, it's not a secret that when asked, would he honor, when the New York Times reporters, David, uh, David Sanger and Mark Maggie Haberman asked him, will you honor the NATO treaty? He said, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's, it's not a secret that he hired the consigliere to this corrupt Russian puppet ruler of Ukraine as his campaign manager, or that he aligned his party's platform, himself, his platform and then the Republican platform with the Russian view on Crimea and Ukraine and Syria and NATO and the EU. Every American president since Dwight Eisenhower has wanted to see a more integrated Europe. Every American president since Britain joined in the 1970s, beginning with Gerald Ford, has wanted to see Britain in the EU. These are 40 years and 60 years of consistent American foreign policy. And John, Donald Trump dropped them to adopt the pro-Putin line. Is he being blackmailed? Is he infatuated? Is he beholden? I don't know. I just see what he's doing. I don't need to know the answer why. I mean, it's interesting. I'd like to know it. But I can see what he's doing. He is the central Soviet first and that Russian later foreign policy project. Their highest paramount foreign policy strategic goal has been to sever the bond between the United States and Germany. If they could ever do that, they've been trying to do that since 1946. If they could ever do that, their power in Europe would be reestablished again. Mm. They have failed at every turn from 1946. And now Donald Trump's campaign is making the relationship with Germany their target. And, and, and aggressively um, attacking uh, German interests and German values again and again and again, and gleefully celebrating the breakup of the EU and the exit of France from the EU, which would be a catastrophe for Germany. Um, if the Russians had written out a to-do list for a president of the United States, that president would do everything Donald Trump has done and in the same order. It's strangely disempowering to realize that all the necessary bad news is in plain sight because it was in plain sight during the campaign and he still got elected and he still got supported by people like Paul Ryan. Rather than say something reasonable about Putin, he did nothing but praise him. Rather than say something reasonable and responsible about the hacking of his opponent, he celebrated it. And it just leaves us in a situation where there's less of a basis to hope that the Republicans will pull the brakes on him at any point. 
I have a couple of questions from Twitter here that I just want to kind of rapid fire questions. And then I want to just, as a final topic, talk to you about journalism and the, the state of the media and, and the fake news problem. But this is from Twitter now. Who would you like to see run against Trump in four years? Well, I, I would love to see um, an internal Republican Party uh, primary challenge to him that was successful. Um, I think that could come from a number of our uh, new governors um, elected in, um, in the past couple of cycles. Uh, I, we have an amazing Republican governor in Missouri. Um, he's very—he just elected there. He's beginning his season, his first month as governor. He's totally focused on Missouri stuff. Eric Greitens. Um, I, I, I think he just—he's reform-minded. He's vigorous. Um, he, he, it sounds it sounds like a joke. He's a uh, not only a Navy SEAL, not only a Rhodes Scholar, but a Jewish Navy SEAL and Rhodes uh-huh. Scholar. So I know that that sounds like that sounds like a, a knock knock joke, but it's really it really it really happened. I did not know they made Jewish Navy SEALs. Uh, Rhodes, yes, exactly. But but, but they did. And he wrote a, and he's a wonderful writer. He wrote a wonderful book about um, a very winning book about about his experience of surviving the Navy SEAL uh, course. Um, uh, uh, people people like that. Um, if there isn't a primary challenge, um, I, I have to say. Uh, I, obviously, I would like if the Democrat I, I, that would put me in a position of having to vote a, for a Democrat for the second time in my life, which I, will be uncomfortable for me. Um, in that case, I would like somebody who um, is as much a national security Democrat, a business oriented Democrat, a uh, keep the taxes and spending not too berserk and the political correctness not too crazy mm-hmm. uh, kind of Democrat. Um, I don't know if they're still making those Democrats, and I don't know four years from now they'll be still making those Democrats. But the closer. The, uh, the closer the Democratic nominee looks to Bob Rubin, the happier I'll be. Yeah, this is my concern. You've just alluded to my concern about the Democratic and the liberal response to Trump. I just see that Trump is bringing out the worst in the left. We're seeing this swing into identity politics, and it's amplifying everything that was guaranteed to lose against him the first time around. Do you think the Democrats can regroup here and become more centrist and, and sane on, on these issues? I am still, look, I think the future here is still so plastic, so moldable, that I, I don't like to be in the prediction business. Um, what I, I want to do, I want to be in the action business. Mm. Um, and uh, so I am working for independent-minded, supporting independent-minded Republicans in Congress in the next two years. After that, um, if there's any plausible person in the Republican Party who will make a primary challenge to Donald Trump, I will, uh, in, including if I disagree with them about almost if Ted Cruz does it, I will be knocking on doors for Ted Cruz, um, and uh, somebody I would not normally support for president, but I would rather see Ted Cruz as president than Donald Trump. Um, Ted Cruz is a—I I don't think he'll get us into a nuclear war by accident. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a, a low bar. Yes, it's a very low bar. <laughs> but um, yeah. but I'll t- you take. I think one of my one of my personal rules for the next four years is don't be so fussy. <laughs> Don't be so fast. <laughs> Take what you can get. Um, and and if there is no primary challenge, um, you know, look, I'd rather see Bernie Sanders be president than Donald Trump. I mean, as crazy as he is, I think he's not a crook. Yeah. Okay. More Twitter. If Trump's infrastructure spending creates jobs, how do we prevent it from bolstering his authoritarian agenda? That, that's the opening paragraph of the article I wrote for the Atlantic. Um, one of the things that there are two misconceptions. I talked earlier in the program about. Um, don't think he's going to go away on the uh, on his own. Don't think that in this clash between Donald Trump and the FBI, CIA, that the president must lose and the so-called deep state, which isn't that deep, must win. The president has a lot of power for them. And second, don't think he will be as unpopular nine months from now as he is today. Because if you get some kind of tax cut, if you get deficits, if you get fiscal stimulus, if you have an infrastructure program of some kind, and if you have some immigration restriction that um, strengthens wages at a time when the economy is growing. Um, he may turn out to be a pretty popular president, at least popular enough. You just need to get to 50%. Mm. This is not like the olden days when you got north of if you If a president can get to 50% approval rating, that president is probably heading to re-election. Mm. Okay, final Twitter question that is seemingly from left field. I guess there's a point of contact here, but I, I want to know your opinion on this. What's your position on Edward Snowden? Oh, I um, think he should be... Uh, in prison. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know at what point in the process he became a um, a tool of the Russians, whether he, he be at the beginning, the middle, or the, the end when he got asylum in Russia. But I know he has betrayed important American national security secrets. Uh, he has an excuse, as people who do those things always do. Um, if you've got um, 
If you think that you've caught your government doing something illegal, uh, you should put that information in the New York Times, not in the hands of Russian intelligence, and then you should stay home and defend yourself in court and prove to the country that you were right and the government was wrong. But if you give the material to the, to, uh, the Russian state and take refuge in the Russian state, I have no, not a tingle of sympathy for anything you did, no matter how justifiable you claim it was. Needless to say, that only strengthened your conservative bona fides with our audience, which makes everything you've said about Trump and the Republicans all the more poignant. Let's just take a, a few minutes to talk about what's happened to journalism and how we fix it, because I guess let's take this from the, the side of, of a rosy future. If I told you that over the next 10 years, we ushered in the golden age of journalism and that social media became an unambiguous force for good, and we, we just solved all these problems of fake news and misaligned incentives, and we had a truly healthy media landscape, how did we get there? Well, I, I think um, there are some grounds to hope that uh, we will see some kind of renewal of national spirit because of the Trump presidency. I think that really is a possible thing. I mean, there's, I see little spring buds everywhere around me. Um, if you're, if you work for a mainstream media company like, like the Atlantic, we have never had more readership than we've had in the past few weeks. And not only readership, we have people, we've had people, we've had a surge in subscriptions. People want suddenly want to pay for journalism. They understand that if you don't pay for it, you get RT and Infowars. Yeah. If you, uh, they're getting that. The New York Times has seen the, apparently the biggest surge in its online traffic, its online subscriptions ever. Um, and meanwhile, papers that have been um, less to the fore in telling the truth about Donald Trump, like the Wall Street Journal, have seen their prospects damaged. Um, there's a, the market is saying we want truth and we'll pay, pay for it. Now there there are limits here, but because remember most people do get their news from Facebook. Facebook is the media biggest and most important media company in America, and Fox News is going from strength to strength. And I think that's an unfortunate development. But I also see a, a real rise in civic engagement. Um, you see uh, these people who are coming to the town halls, that is tremendously inspired. That's how you hold the authorities accountable. Go to their town halls, confront your congressman, and you know be respectful and responsible, but be firm. He works for you, after all. Um, she works for you. Uh, I, so that's the scenario, is that this becomes a, a season of political engagement. The New energy in journalism is pretty obvious, and that's fairly thrilling, except this fake news meme is really insidious. I mean, there, there's the real fake news, and then there's the fake fake news. There's the aspersion cast upon real news as being fake just because you don't happen to like it. This is obviously coming mostly from the right and from Trump defenders. How do we inoculate ourselves against the power of this meme, where basically everyone has siloed themselves my news source considers your, your news source fake news, and, and you return yeah. the favor. It should just be obvious that when the New York Times commits an error and corrects it, that does not vitiate the integrity of the New York Times for all time, and that certainly doesn't put it on all fours with some blog that is just manufacturing fake news. And yet that seems to be what has happened. There are people who just will not trust anything in yeah. The mainstream media now, what do we do with that? Good journalists make mistakes for the same reason that good scientists often get things wrong. And the truth-seeking process, and you've written about this, the truth-seeking process is not one where you start, if you, if you knew it already, you wouldn't need to go seek it. Um, it is uh, a process of hypothesis, of checks, of errors, and of correction. And the corrections are as integral to the process um, as any other part of it. And that's the difference between, and, and of course, and we all have our biases. The New York Times certainly has a lot of biases, biases both in terms of, of um, what they select. I think in retrospect, people will look back on the New York Times coverage in 2016 and would say, in the face of this slow moving catastrophe, that was what Donald Trump was about to do, move to America. Did you really have to print 80 articles or whatever it was about transgender rights? That was mm -hmm. what, that was your news, that was your great crusading cause in the year 2016? You joking? Um, you know, they have biases um, and imperfections and flaws, but they, they're in a different business from deliberate, the deliberate production of propaganda, which is the Fox News business, or the, the construction actually of lies in order to have political effect, which is what RT does. Um, and th those are differences. How do we get past that? You alluded, you, your question contained the answer, um, which is it's, un we wish it were true, 
that the reason that we have that we are polarized in our opinions is because we have different facts, and if we'd only somehow agree on the facts, we'd have the same opinions. As you know, that you frame this, in my opinion, exactly correctly. We start with the different points of view, and then we go find the different facts to support our point of view. So the answer to this problem about media is embedded in an answer to our society that we have to find some ways to make American society more cohesive. And I have my thoughts about that. They're probably somewhat different from your thoughts, but a more effective and cohesive society in which people feel more people feel they are full participants will be, I think, less vulnerable to this kind mm. of disinformation. So when you say your thoughts are different from mine, you picture some significant role for religion here to bring people together? Religious institutions are important. I think a, a slowdown in the rate of immigration um, is important. We have to be, um, I think, that as society becomes more diverse, it becomes less mutually trusting. Um, it feel, think that politics comes to feel more and more like a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we um, need to see an acceleration of economic growth. Uh, we need to see, we need to be much more clear-minded about the fact that if your town is slowly dying, you're going to have to leave it. Um, we are not, that the job, you're, that the people must move to the jobs, not the jobs to the people. Mm. This has nothing to do with Trump. We just have this, the basic fact that technological progress is of necessity replacing human labor and the labor is not coming back. Those coal mining jobs are not going to come back and yeah. the auto working jobs are not going to come back when auto workers get replaced by robots. We just have to deal with all of the casualties of that progress head on. Retraining for a you know a fifty five year old auto worker, that auto worker is not going to be the next software engineer at Facebook, right? So we need a social safety net and kind of a new ethic of absorbing the consequences of bad luck better than we do. Well, uh, this is this takes us very far off topic, but yeah. so, I mean, some look some of the answers to this are contained on the left. Um, we do need a more universal and more national system of health coverage. That people should not be if, if they should not be trapped in a town because if they move to a place where there's more work, they have to worry that their health coverage will be will be lost. Um, but some things are hard teachings. Like um, we really need to take another look at this this disability system. Uh, you it is which is turned into de facto income supplements for people who've been made jobless, redundant by by uh, technological change, and. I sympathize with the judges. I mean, you, you sit in that chair and you see 20 cases a day of men who are genuinely hurt or injured, who could work, but who don't have the skills to work, and who, if you don't give them this disability pension, are eligible for virtually nothing. So mm -hmm. the judge cracks and starts giving people a disability. But those lock them in their places where they, they live. I, I'm, a, I'm a big defender of the pharmaceutical industry, otherwise known as the people who are curing cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but their role in the distribution of these opioid painkillers is not innocent. And we need, again, to read. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I think we all have to, one of the tests of our intellectual vitality is our willingness to let things that bother us more change our views about things that bother us less. Um, you know, I, I've always been, for example, a very hard line. I've been a very much a hard line on the marijuana question. But I, you know, I've had to consider, you know, if, if, if people have mild recurring pain and they're going to be addicted to something, probably is better that they use marijuana than opioids. And so that's part of my, you know, those are some of the, the sort of the new doors. It, but if I talked before about Donald Trump as a challenge to our citizenship, it's a challenge to the frozenness of our political discussions that we have these real problems and we have these stagnant Republican and Democratic parties frozen in the politics of the 80s and the Republicans are somewhat worse, but the Democrats are only slightly better. Mm. And it created the readiness for this agent of destruction. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to begin the process of digging out with you, and you are very much a man who is meeting his moment. It's wonderful to see you on Twitter. I recommend that all of our listeners follow you on Twitter. You are just a fount of good information and appropriate ire on the topic of what's happening in Washington right now. So please keep it up, David. Thank you for taking so much time with me. I know you are very busy, and I hope this is just the first of many conversations, and I hope we have more fun things to talk about in the future. I, I'm really honored to be here, and I, I salute your work, and uh, you've always been such a great guest in such programs as Bill Mara. That was, that was a really wonderful interview, and so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, honored to be able to talk to you with you sitting in the Bill Mara chair. Nice. And me, and me sitting in the Sam Harris, Harris chair. Thank you so much. Yeah, to be continued. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. 
You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast, or you can support it directly at samharris.org forward slash support.